Great. Um, so hi again. Welcome, everyone. I am Allison Korn, clinical professor and director of the Health Justice Clinic at Duke Law School. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to our Teaching Justice webinar series and our second session of the 2022-23 school year. Today, the, the topic is critical legal research teaching social justice oriented research in clinic. And our presenters that I'm so excited to introduce to you all are Priya Baskaran from American Washington College of Law and Nicholas Mignanelli from Yale Law. Hi, everyone. So great to see you all. Um, I'm Layla Halas. I'm a clinical professor of law at Tulane. Uh, I'm also a member uh, of uh, the CLIA and co-chair of CLIA's Best Practices um, Teaching Justice Webinar uh, Committee. Uh, and today's talk is part of that lecture series. Um, we've featured a number of innovative faculty who discuss different approaches to teaching justice in the classroom. And each of these sessions, hopefully you've seen them, they're on the website. Uh, we have all of these recorded. Um, they each kind of examine the intersections of teaching justice with criminal justice, immigration policy, racial justice, economic justice. We're so excited to feature legal research uh, at, in today's session. Um, our next session will be on December 8th, and it's going to feature Rachel Lopez, Kempis, Ghani, Songster, and Terrell Rel Carter, who are presenting participatory scholarship and redeeming justice. So we hope you stay tuned uh, to the CLIA website, um, as well as the listeners will be posting more information about the next session and, of course, the spring as well. Um, as you have undoubtedly um, gotten a message about already, this session is being recorded. We will make that available on the CLIA website where you'll be able to find it and all of our past sessions. Um, we'll circulate that information and links, as Layla said, through the list serves and also through the website. Uh, for today's session, we do encourage interaction using the chat function. Um, and if you have a question during the session, please use the chat function to raise it. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, and our presenters will also make some time during and or after the presentation to do some Q&A and facilitate a discussion. Um, we do ask everybody to go ahead and mute their microphones. Uh, if you're comfortable, you're welcome to keep your video on during the session. And with that, I will turn it over to Priya and Nick. Nicholas, we're so happy you're here. Thanks so much for being here, for inviting us. We're so we're so excited to do this. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Priya Baskaran. I teach at American University's Washington College of Law. Um, I run the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic, which represents community organizations, nonprofits, micro enterprises, small businesses, and so social enterprises. But basically, I'm a business lawyer for good, right? Not um, the anti-Elon Musk transactional attorney. So... Um, I will start, uh, that's right, I feel comfortable saying that while being recorded. So um, I will start by providing some scaffolding for, you know, what we're trying to talk about today and why we think that this is an important topic. So one of the many amazing things about the clinical community is that we are constantly innovating and thinking critically about how do we imbue social justice into things that are often sold as, you know, content neutral, like interviewing, like client counseling, right? And it's led to an amazing amount of pedagogical interview, uh, innovation. I, you know, I see, I saw Lindsay Harris, right? And Layla Glass have obviously talked about the importance of critical interviewing skills. Client-centered lawyering is something that is you know, pretty much standard now in the clinic community. And so oftentimes we think about legal research as a core skill in terms of lawyering, but to think of it as sort of content neutral or not as a tool for social justice is like truly problematic because it doesn't actually represent uh, the reality of what's going on. And it is such a key intervention for our clients and for our students. And so that's what we're hoping to talk about today. Um, Nicholas is gonna provide some large framing for the theories behind uh, critical legal research and critical information literacy. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, entry points for 
application within our already overpacked clinic seminars, right? So in a way, we get to do the best of both worlds, right? Incept our students into becoming better researchers, but also more thoughtful social justice oriented researchers using critical legal research. But we're going to stop there and we're going to send out a little poll um, that we're going to share the results at the end. So if we can just take a few minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take the poll myself. Great. So Priya, should I get started then? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna share my slides. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. And uh, I'm just, I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction to critical legal research. One thing I should say when I talk about these ideas is I didn't come up with them. Uh, there are a lot of law librarians and legal information scholars who have been thinking about this for decades. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to capture sort of what I think is going on uh, in this community of critical law librarians. Um, so, you know, when I talk about critical legal research, I would define it as applying the insights of critical legal theory to the legal research process. So to talk about critical legal research, I kind of just have to talk very briefly about critical legal theory. I know there's a lot of uh, experts here today. Uh, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about it and to sort of frame where those insights are coming in. Um, so critical legal theory as sort of um, a movement that comes in three waves that are overlapping uh, with high points and that sort of, there are scholars that of course continue to write in all of these schools today. So it begins with critical legal studies in the late 1970s. Um, it's a movement, a sub-movement that begins to slow down in the late 80s. Uh, causes include the arrival of 60s counterculture into the law school classroom, the introduction of continental uh, European theory into legal scholarship, deconstructionism and post-structuralism. Um, also just the logical conclusion of legal realism that had come to dominate the legal academy. Uh, there's no unifying theory in critical legal studies. Uh, but there are some general themes that we can look at. So uh, that law is indeterminate, uh, that law is politics by another means, that legal reasoning is a myth and a process of mystification, and also the reification of legal categories, uh, that we take reality and we try to shove them in these abstract categories. Now, critical legal studies was primarily was a very white heterosexual male endeavor. A lot of white heterosexual male scholars uh, with elite credentials at top law schools. And female CLS scholars began to say, there's it's one thing to theorize about domination. There's another, it's another thing to experience it. Uh, so feminist legal scholars began to want to create a space of their own. Now, one thing is within feminist legal theory, there are, of course, competing schools. There's equality feminism. That's sort of what Justice Ginsburg was doing at the ACLU. Uh, dominance feminism of Professor Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dorkin. Postmodern feminism of the late Mary Jo Frug. Uh, but the methods actually unify feminist legal theory in a lot of ways in terms of the methods of unmasking patriarchy, consciousness raising, coming together to discuss issues, uh, storytelling. And the other thing I should mention is gay and lesbian scholars later borrow these methods to advocate for their own plight. Critical scholars of color also had issues with critical legal studies. They liked the critical legal studies themes, the tools, uh, but they felt that CLS had failed to address systemic racism. And also critical legal studies scholars were beginning to attack rights, saying rights are socially constructed. 
to which early critical race there is said, well, yes, of course, rights are constructed, but communities of color need rights. They're important to us. So uh, critical scholars of color came together at a convent in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989. Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term critical race theory uh, for that conference. And much of critical race theory is rooted in the writings of Professor Derek Bell, who was a Harvard Law professor for many years, uh, an ardent protester, an activist. Um, and what I love about this photo is the LexisNexis shirt in the background, uh, which like law school really hasn't changed in the last few decades. Um, precepts that most, most critical race theorists would agree on is that racism in American society is ordinary, it's everyday. Uh, interest convergence, the idea that the white elite in our society, um, that communities of color only progress when it benefits the white elite in our society, uh, that race is socially constructed, differential racialization, the idea that different racial groups uh, are racialized in different ways at different times, depending on the needs of the white elite, uh, that identity is intersectional, and also legal storytelling, the idea that people of color have unique stories that can be told uh, in such a way as to expose people to information that wouldn't be accessible otherwise. Some sub movements that come out of this are Latin crit, Asian American jurisprudence, tribal crit, and of course, critical race theory moves into fields like education, the humanities, social sciences. And of course, there's all controversy today in the political sphere. And when people, commentators say critical race theory, they usually don't know what they're talking about, uh, which is really unfortunate because it's such an important legal movement and framework. So critical legal studies and feminist legal theorists uh, did criticize legal information uh, on the margins. Duncan Kennedy writes about the reification of legal categories and his deconstruction of Blackstone's commentaries. Mary Jo Frug theorizes about what she calls authoritarian neutrality in uh, a feminist reader response criticism critique of a contracts case book. Um, but it wasn't until 1989 when the critical race theorists Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanczyk give us a systematic critical theory of legal information. And this is called the triple helix dilemma. So I have to bring you all back to the late 1980s in order to sort of like tee this story up, uh, which is 1989, Delgado and Stefanczyk published Why Do We Tell the Same Stories? Law Reform, Critical Librarianship, and the Triple Helix Dilemma. And we have to think about what research tools look like at this time. So if you want to find a treatise or a monograph at this time, uh, you're going to use a library catalog, uh, typically based on the Library of Congress subject headings. And of course, library catalogs tend to uh, still exist to this day. But we have to think about this as the age of the controlled vocabulary. Keyword searching hadn't become as dominant in legal research as it is today. To find a law review article, you'd have to use a periodical index, such as the Index of Legal Periodicals. This, is, of course, exists today as a database, but here we see keyword searching eclipsing this controlled vocabulary. And to find a case, of course, uh, you would have to use the West Digest system, uh, and this still exists today. It's being incorporated in search algorithms, and I'll touch on that a little later. So the key word here is, you know, the buzzword is structural determinism. So Delgado and Stefanczyk say that together these systems fu function like molecular biology's double helix to replicate pre-existing ideas, thoughts, and approaches. And they give us a very interesting hypothetical. They say, suppose you're an attorney and a black female client comes to you and tells you that she was wrongfully terminated by a white male employer because she is a black woman. That his comments and actions lead her to believe that she was discriminated against on this basis. And the other thing you should know is that she has two colleagues, two former coworkers, uh, a white woman and a black male. So you decide to kind of research, is there some type of discrimination on the basis of being a woman of color? And you start with the West Digest system. And you go into the index and you see under discrimination, there's a subject heading for race and there's a subject heading for sex, but there doesn't seem to be a category that combines the two. You find cases about sex discrimination, race discrimination, but no cases that seem to combine them. You look for, maybe you say, well, maybe there's a law review article on this. And so you go into the index to legal periodicals uh, and you find 
undue discrimination, a category, once again, for race and a category for sex, but no category that combines the two. So essentially, what you're forced to do is go back to your client and say that you've researched this and that while there's categories for race discrimination and sex discrimination, there's no other, it doesn't seem that there are other causes of action. And of course, if you bring this case, a case on the basis of race discrimination, the white male employer is going to say, uh, well, I actually have very happy uh, black employees. And if you bring it on the basis of sex discrimination, uh, this white male employer will say, well, I have very happy female employees. Um, and by the way, this was actually a real problem that faced civil rights lawyers throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, so Delgado and Stefanczyk say that until there is a thinker with vision and experience and I and to identify and name this problem, we just sort of keep on keeping on. In this case, Kimberly Crenshaw finally conceptualizes this issue uh, and calls it intersectional discrimination and describes this phenomenon uh, in order that we can begin to work towards remedying it. So what are some solutions in the research realm to this? How do we fix these research systems? And Delgado and Stefanczyk suggest first, the first solution would be to look to divergent individuals. So what? Um, so looking to individuals whose experience has been outside the mainstream, who can provide perspectives that differ from the mainstream narratives that we encounter in research systems. Also to study the system itself, to examine the legal categories and systems for greater insight into the very conceptual framework uh, that we have been wielding and in interpreting our societal order. So turning the system on its head, looking to see what's missing in order to sort of be more creative about the solutions we can come up with. Now in 2007, Delgado and Stefanczyk revisit their triple helix dilemma theory. And there had been a lot of discussion about maybe keyword searching had fixed this. Maybe keyword searching, right? Because now we're not sort of tethered to these controlled vocabularies. Now you can search for whatever you want across uh, hundreds of thousands of documents in a database. And they actually conclude that keyword searching had made the problem worse because keyword searching suppresses analogical reasoning. It creates a situation of information overload. It conceals the contingency and indeterminacy of the law. And I think the, the most troubling part is it gives researchers unwarranted confidence. It encourages confirmation bias. So their solution to this is somewhat counterintuitive, which is to shut the computer off, to mull over, don't just keep searching for that next case, but to mull over what the ideal world would look like from the client's perspective, to think outside the box, uh, to try to modify and flip and radically transform existing legal doctrines in sort of brainstorming sessions. Now in 2015, Nicholas Stump, a librarian at West Virginia University, coins the phrase critical legal research to describe this approach to legal research, this approach pioneered by Delgado and Stefanczyk and other thinkers like Jillian Farmer uh, and Steve Barkin and Robert Baring. Um, and these counterintuitive critical strategies and methods, uh, he sort of puts into what he calls a loose framework, a CLR framework. So what's this framework, this supplemental framework to sort of um, enhance traditional legal research uh, has sort of several facets of it. Uh, internalizing critical insights, that's making critical analysis of law and legal information second nature as a researcher. Concept-based research, that's pushing back against the focus on the overfocus now on fact-specific research that further reifies the law. Uh, looking at alternative legal resources, trying to get beyond the legal research corporate duopoly that we're living in. Uh, legal, looking to legal scholarly and multidisciplinary research, looking, be, uh, looking to theoretical legal and non-legal scholarship for solutions, for inspiration as a practitioner. Um, and unplugged brainstorming. So stepping away from the computer to engage in brainstorming with other activist and movement attorneys. Now, my own work has been trying to take Delgado and Stefanczyk and Stump and their critical legal research theory framework uh, and combining it with scholarship 
that looks at legal research technology. So uh, pioneered by uh, thinkers like Susan Nevlo Mart and Ron Wheeler, uh, and to sort of look at this new phenomenon of AI powered legal research. And when we think about algorithmic legal research or AI powered legal research, what we have to remember is that there are biases embedded, that there is nothing objective about the answers that AI powered legal research tools are giving you. And this is what we need to begin telling students and teaching students. This is sort of the critical legal information literacy aspect of it. Because programmers who come from a homogeneous background are writing the algorithmic rules. They're making subjective choices about, for instance, relevance. Algorithms, algorithms also rely on past user data. And those users were those who could afford uh, to use these platforms in the past. You can imagine sort of what these folks look like or where they work, government, big law firms. Uh, and so my biggest issue with AI is not only these biases that are going to be embedded, but also that as a researcher, it's, con it's entrenching society's dominant interests in these research systems. And it's also concealing the legal research process, right? It's backloading the research process, but the legal research process is itself the creative process of lawyering. That's something that we're beginning to lose sight of, I think, with these technologies. So what are some new CLR methods and strategies for an algorithmic age? And I would say um, algorithmic activism, demanding transparency, using skepticism in dealing with these new tools, teaching our students to question vendors when they say things like, AI will do your research for you. Well, what's the sample size? You're saying it will predict what the right case will be. Where did that information come from? Who has control over the rules that are being written in the algorithm? Uh, Transgressive and archaeological bibliography. So to me, this is reviving bibliography and using it to create uh, tools that list sources in chronological order in order to uh, conceptualize the social construction of the law and also to include non-traditional sources that challenge prevailing narratives in the law. And finally, I think formalizing unplugged brainstorming that in legal academia, we have colloquia and symposia um, maybe activists and movement lawyers need to begin moving in this direction of more collaboration with each other, using each other as a source in this sort of AI legal research age we're moving into. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Priya. Great. Thanks so much, Nicholas. So what I want to emphasize as we move into sort of what this looks like in the clinic classroom is the big takeaways from um, Nicholas's presentation. Um, so databases, so, you know, we started with the print resources, but remember like Westlaw, Lexis, they're based on those print sources. So all of that, all of that inaccuracy is baked in and then built on, right, through like these AI tools, right? It is very hard to get a lot, I, I can't get my law students to stop Googling when I am talking to them, asking them a question of like, well, uh, what is that, what statute is involved? Stop typing, stop typing, stop typing, right? So all of that really just sort of compounds the learning problems that they're already having by thinking that they're racing to an answer. And I wanna stop here and just talk about the results of the poll. So the vast majority of people who responded to the poll said that they are, um, they did not have a standalone legal research class for their at their law school, that it was embedded within uh, the legal write, uh, writing program. And, and a few respondents said that there was a, um, there was an independent research class and, and one respondent said that they didn't know. And I'll admit that when I started at American University, I just assumed that it was an independent course because it had been um, where I had taught before. And then when I mentioned it to my husband, who's also a Michigan alum, he said, didn't we just learn it from Lexus Nexus reps? Remember we used to get those points and then I, I won that crappy speaker that's still in our house. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. So, you know, it's it's really like in terms of quality control or understanding, it's all over the, the board, which is why it's a useful skill to teach in clinic, but we have to think about how we can teach it in this social justice oriented way, I think to be really effective. Um, so let me see, okay. So um, in my clinic, I teach legal research with the assistance of a librarian as a single module. And so my module focuses on the following. It focuses on deconstructing the databases. So having 
essentially a, you know, peeling back the curtains moment of telling my students, these are constructed databases for commercial purposes. They're not some sort of neutral benevolent resource that's been created by like the librarian in the sky. Um, and then because they have, they are constructed and you're not seeing everything and somebody is making a decision to organize information, you have to incorporate that into how you approach the case and the research. And we do that through unplugged brainstorming. And finally, then we sort of engage in reconstructing and reconfiguring the actual research strategy. Um, and so I'm just gonna quickly walk through a couple of ways in which I try to do this in my class. We have a really robust um, transactional hypo that involves tax law that I have embedded throughout the, the course um, to sort of help reinforce the lessons. But there are a couple of really quick activities that I think a lot of people can do and adapt to their area of law to you know sort of foment discussion. So I play this game called the top five exercise, right? And I have two hypothetical clients that I assign. I break students up into teams. They're assigned a reading from a tax research chapter in a tax law book that talks about all of the different types, the wide you know, world of, of tax authorities out there. Um, and then I divide them into teams and I say, okay, you are assigned the, our social enterprise client, who is a 501c3 organization, which is an IRS tax designation, which we typically think of as a nonprofit, you know, in everyday parlance. And this organization is dedicated to assisting returning citizens. Um, they provide them with wraparound social services and workforce development. And they're creating this exciting new program, but they're worried it's going to have tax implications for the nonprofit. So they've come to the clinic to really you know, talk through some of their structuring concerns and figure out any possible solutions. So it's really help us design this program so that we don't get in trouble with the IRS. Then we move over to the second scenario. Some of you may be familiar with this gentleman. He is was made famous by a TV program from the early aughts called uh, The Jersey Shore. And so Mike, the situation, his nickname, Sorrentino, uh, was actually, he actually pled guilty for tax fraud. So we are imagining a scenario where before his guilty plea, the situation comes to you and says, I'm in a bind. Like, what do I do as my attorney? I'm trying not to go to jail. You know, like, do I have a case? What can I do? Right. So I divide the students into groups with these clients. And then I say, OK, what I want you to do is rank your top five authorities of tax law, depending on, you know, for your clients. So you're only going to be able to check five boxes in the database in terms of what you look for. What are you going to pick? And what we discover is that the relevant authority depends on the situation, right? So if it is a controversy, then you are going to look at case law as you are going to look at certainly certain regulations. You're going to look at um, administrative hearings. You're actually going to look at the appellate procedures, right? And the um, administrative procedures to say, okay, is this issue even still ripe depending on our timing, right? In contrast, when you are talking about a corporate structuring case, case law is not going to be as helpful because the law is really designed around controversy, right? And it's not designed around creative problem solving and corporate structuring. The hope in corporate structuring is that you don't run afoul of the law, that you're never in an adjudication situation, right? And so we are going to all of a sudden feel like the law is thin, right, for our social enterprise clients because we don't, we're not getting as many search results. So, but does that mean it's a bad idea or, you know, or that we have quote unquote bad law or is it a, a circumstance of construction, right? And to sort of drive this home, I talk about it in other scenarios too. So um, I was talking about this with one of my colleagues who does um, workers' rights. And we were talking about how there are all of these individuals now who are claiming unemployment or like seeking unemployment um, benefits based on COVID related things that have yet to be fully litigated, right? So if, you're, if your employer was not taking the proper precautions and you felt that risk and you left your job as a result, you know, there's not a lot of case law as to whether or not you should be or are entitled to COVID benefits, right? But does that mean that we don't advocate for that person, that we don't take that case because the law is not on your side? Because I'm pretty sure when Uber was like, I wanna start a taxi company, 
and not get any medallions and just pay a bunch of parking tickets, you know, their lawyers were probably not coming to the table saying that's a terrible idea. You know, they were instead tasked with trying to figure it out because what they were doing was disruption or innovation, right? So having that, I mean, and why is disruption or innovation like the realm of Silicon Valley? Shouldn't we disrupt or innovate for social justice? And that's kind of the conversation that we try to have. So it's like, okay, now that we know that the that what the databases show us is not everything that's out there, right? Or or is partial, what do we do? So this is where I tell my students, we have to turn off the computer, right? We have to sit back and engage in unplugged brainstorming. We've got to do the slow think process that feels very difficult for them, right? So we, we're going to sit and we're going to map out everything in terms of what the ultimate vision is. What are the client's short and long-term goals? What are the priorities? Where are our deal breakers? What is our risk tolerance, right? And then based on all of this, let's come up with some ideal solutions, right? Let's throw some spaghetti at the wall. And then once we have our vision of where we are trying to get to, then let's talk about what are the actual legal issues involved? What are the obstacles? What are the intersecting legal regimes that we have to write down and really think about that are gonna then inform our research process? And then let's be honest, what can we immediately identify as possible gaps or shortcomings in the realm of traditional legal research resources, right? Because if you don't know and you can't anticipate what the gaps are, then you're not going to be able to create an effective research strategy that is broad enough, right? Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to hit negative law or not enough search results and then you're just going to quit, right? Which is not actually effective advocacy for your client. So from there, that's when we engage in traditional legal research methodology, right? That's when we start, now that we have our big picture, we start putting together our legal research questions. We start thinking about what our associated search terms are. Then we start thinking about where we search, right? We talk about when we Google, because they're going to Google. You can't say no to Google. Um, we talk about when we use Westlaw and Lexis, and then we talk about when we maybe want to start using some of those divergent thinkers and where to find them. Um, and then and then we talk about when we bring our search results back, how do we read and analyze them to understand the gaps, right, and why we're not getting exact answers, right? So if we're not finding anything in our jurisdiction related to, you know, COVID unemployment insurance claims, do we look to another jurisdiction, right? Do we look to a similar, or, or like you can imagine, this is going to happen with long COVID cases. Can we look at another type of long disease like that, right? Um, you know, that is going to cause the same types of issues that we can draw a corollary to, right? So, Thinking like this is part and parcel of effective legal research, right? It's not just can you find the best, you know, Boolean search in order to find the, the most amount of cases or that perfect puzzle piece. So that's really what we're trying to train students how to do within clinic when we do critical legal research. So that being said, I cannot move forward for some reason. There we go. Um, Right, so we just talked about this a little bit, right, um, about the COVID-19 um, issues. And then, um, you know, again, the, the bottom line is sort of committing to this deconstruct, unplug, and reconstruct model. Um, and then, so finally, what we wanted to reiterate with both the survey results and the collaboration opportunities is that the, the bar is all over the place in terms of what students know when they walk into clinic. And many of us, like like me, I don't get students until they're third year students. And so the chances of them having taken any re legal research class at all in between um, their 1L class when they're researching appellate briefs and then when I'm introducing them to the specialized tax databases, right, is very, very thin, right? So we've got to do a lot of legwork, which is why there might be really great opportunities for collaboration with the library and research faculty who might be able to kind of come in and do this work. But that being said, just as everybody is not an expert in critical interviewing, right, or trauma-centered lawyering, not every librarian is an expert in um, critical legal research, although so fortunately, I think today, just from looking at the attendees, we do have several of you. Um, so 
you know, to one of the things that we've prepared, and Layla, I think I emailed this to you, is we have a helpful bibliography for anybody interested in learning more. And anyone interested in kind of thinking about how to embed this in their course, Nicholas has very generously offered to, you know, sort of be a point of contact to kind of talk through possibilities and exercises. Um, but we just wanted to sort of introduce the concept and really illustrate that the lecture alone of traditional research, while helpful is not effective in training social justice oriented attorneys when left on its own and because we have this opportunity to do so much better while still training students to do traditional legal research it's really an exciting opportunity to be able to do this work collectively so i'm going to stop there uh, and then see if anyone has any questions I just wanted to reiterate that I was having an issue uploading it to the chat. So I just sent an email. So everyone should have in their inbox the bibliography who's registered. Um, and I think you kind of addressed this question or kind of earlier. I don't know, um, Nick or Priya, if you'd like to say anything further about this question that, you know, um, Jay Knight posed. Um, which you, you've talked a little bit about, but kind of how you, um, what you do about kind of uh, about reliance uh, on Wikipedia um, and other internet sources. So I, 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 so I also do this exercise, which blew my students' minds, um, where I talk about secondary sources and you could just see like their eyes rolling around in their heads, like, oh, here we go, you know? And um, and I explained to them, I'm like, hey, so let's let's go to my favorite secondary source for this particular topic, which is written by Bruce Hopkins. It's the law of tax exempt organizations. I was like, let me tell you what Google's doing, guys. It was like you like when you type in the words you need, like unrelated business income tax, charitable organizations, Google is literally like that claw in the arcade. Right. And it's just going to the table of contents in this book. And then it's just pulling out a random thing, right? So like, maybe it's the right answer or maybe it's a total waste of your time, but you could totally not waste your time or my time or your employer's time because you won't, he's gonna be paying for that if you actually go to the secondary source and then you read. And then we have um, both librarians and practitioners every time they guest lecture in our class. Um, one of the questions I, I asked, two questions I asked, first of all, is a hot dog a sandwich, explain yourself. And then I ask is um, like, what is the secondary source in your area of law? And regardless of if I have an insurance law professional, a labor lawyer, right, an immigration expert come in, or a like product counsel for like a tech firm, they will say, this is the secondary source for my area of law. And I'm like, this is what you need to know. The actual practicing attorney who you want to be when you leave this building goes to a secondary source and they think that you know what that secondary source is. So rather than being the Google claw, you know, like you need to you need to read because this is the generation that's grown up with Google. So they haven't like thought about it at all. So one of the things that we do in our exercise is I have a very helpful um uh, like research log that a librarian at, at AU created specialized for my class. We work together on it. And at the top, we, we have a little key that's like, when do I Google? And it's like, you Google if you don't know the definition of something. If you know the legal term that you are looking for, try the secondary source first, right? Or, you know, go start from there so that it will, it will lead you down a more concrete path. But I think really explaining to them the expectations of the field, but then also what what the machine is doing is, is super resonant. Now my students were in week 12 and my students don't go to Google anymore as the first thing, if they know the term. I'm gonna do the really annoying academic thing that you do when you wanna answer a question, but then it allows you to talk about what you wanna talk about. Uh, so, you know, I, it reminds me, there's a study that came out recently where social scientists said that like judges are relying on Wikipedia now, and which is just like incredible. And I always say to my students, Wikipedia is fine. Googling is fine. But why would you waste your time on Wikipedia when you have access to Amjur or CJS or all of these incredible treatises? And uh, 
I think this is a problem of knowledge with our students. And this is, I'm a librarian, so of course I'm going to say this, but I really think what we need in the legal academy right now is a standalone legal research course extricated from writing. Because what needs to happen in that course is we have been gutting public libraries in this country for decades. So there's no information, basic, there needs to be remedial information literacy happening in this course. And then there needs to be advanced uh, sort of technology uh, evaluation going on. And this is a huge, you know, I think one credit legal research course, and I think clinicians are great allies on this with librarians because we're both sort of groups that I think are not always respected in the legal academy. I think we can be really, and we're also teaching the things that are in fact what law practice is. So I don't know. So that's that's sort of my aside on that. I think I always tell my students, Wikipedia and Google are fine, but why waste your time? So we need to find a way to teach them legal information literacy, critical legal information literacy, so then we can tee them up if they're gonna be movement and activist lawyers to learn those supplemental uh, strategies and methods that we've been talking about today. We're open to criticism too. I have two yeah. small children, I could take a punch. Any other questions that folks have? Yeah. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I teach in a little bit of a different context. I um, I run in uh, I run a paralegal studies program at an undergraduate college, and I'm looking for OER resources. Um, and I don't know if you have if if you use those here, but um, uh, specifically on skill, you know, on skills and res and research. I have a lot of resources for for research, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are if you uh, are aware of um, where where I could look for some good sources on this type of thing. You know, I think often they're kind of like collectively generated. I, th I think that's been my my view is like some of the best kind of materials tend to be sort of like created by instructors. And I wish there was more like clearing houses to sort of share them. Um, so I don't know. That's I don't know, so other other folks might have some advice. Thanks. Um, let me chime in. I have my little hand raised, but um, I'm Stephanie Wilson at Seattle University School of Law and um, I just want to put this out there and I'll put a link to it in the chat. So I worked with one of our professors on a, it's an, an open uh, educational resource book um, that takes the Korematsu cases and uses them with a very critical legal perspective to teach different subjects in law school. And I co-authored the chapter on legal research analysis and writing and the exercises in that chapter walk you through and walk the students through um, examples of vendor racial bias, which is quite quite, quite shocking to actually see it there, and also um, non-neutrality in the way that they <clears throat> characterize decisions and their impact on other decisions. So I'll put a link to it in the chat, but it's a, you know, I, I think it's a great resource and it addresses exactly what you're talking about. Stephanie, what's the title of the book? It's using Korematsu to teach across the law school curriculum. And it's on our digital Commons site. I think if you if you run a search on the internet for using Korematsu to teach, you'll probably it'll probably pop right up. That looks great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Can you tell us more how you help to support the unplugged brainstorming in the clinic? We have a project this semester where the group we are working with has asked us to think big and creatively. Yeah. So, um, so w when I when I do it, I think the where things get lost. This is like where I have brought in critical legal, legal research is we're really good at like unpacking problems, right? So I usually go through the list of, of prompts from my slides are, are prompts that I go through with my students, right? Where we sort of 
we sort of map out the like the goals, priorities, obstacles, and then we map out like the legal things that we see. And then I we sort of stop there oftentimes, right, in supervision and go, okay, now go research, you know, uh, and that's like not very effective. I think that there's a transference problem there, right? So to me, that was an opportunity to bring in expert librarians, right, to say, okay, so like this is what we're thinking of. What are the research questions that we're going to create? Um, where are we going to look? And let's start building out our research logs so that we know where we're headed in terms of our research. And then the next time we check in, I want you to fill in your research log so I know where you've gone and we know where we can, I can literally see where you are hitting no results or what results you found that you want to keep pursuing so that I can actually kind of track where the thinking is headed. Um, but I think it's very hard for students who might not have had a ton of research experience to begin with to then take the complex questions that we're asking and then apply it because otherwise they're just going to go to Google. Sometimes they give me an answer and I'm like, where did you get this? And they're like, I found it on the Drinker Biddle website. I'm like, why are you going there? How did you get there? And they were like, well, Google took me there. I was like, oh, here we go. Here's the, the claw of Google, right? So I think that that is, that's why bringing it in. And, and honestly, I think what every law school should probably be doing is try to figure out how we can embed a librarian within our clinics, right? So that we have someone within our firm wheelhouse who can help students really do this type of specialized research. Um, and, and that will make them that much more effective in practice. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. So am I unmuted? Yes. Um, thank you. This is fantastic. And my first question was, would you come and do this at BU? But um, um, I recall that it's being taped. So hopefully I'll have um, access to that to show to all of our faculty and everyone that will listen. But um, my um, comment is that um, we're experiencing that students are using less and less in-person reference. Um, so at former jobs of mine at former law schools, we, we actually did embed people in the clinics and it worked it worked um, to an extent, but often the librarians complained that they sat there and, you know, they got two questions this semester because, you know, how it is in the clinic. It's when you need it, you need it. And when you don't, you don't. Um, but I wonder if the offer of um, virtual reference for the clinic and just reminding students that they have access to that link and they can ask a question anytime during their during the day at their clinic, whether that will suffice. What do you think? Um, I think that, yeah, I think that that could be a really great solution. Actually, if we could do the embed during, it, it depends. So my clinic has a really large seminar time. So if we could do the link during the seminar time, I think that that would be really effective, right? To essentially have a, 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 like a librarian, quote unquote, on call, right? Rather than like a dedicated thing. I think that would be a great solution. Sorry, Stephanie, I did see your hand. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the embedding that we've done at Seattle yeah. University School of Law. I've talked about this in different places, but um, so the benefits of it. So what we do is we actually have, and this is dependent on staffing and other things going on, of course, but we would actually embed a reference librarian as a co-professor in a clinic. And that way um, you work with the professor before the class starts and figure out where the pain points are going to be, where they will be struggling with legal research. And then the librarian, come, well, you come in at the beginning so that you're introduced as being part of the clinic and also under the confidentiality rules of the clinic, which um, takes away a lot of student inhibition about uh, talking to librarians because they're outside the firm. Um, and then the librarian comes back in when students are doing case rounds or are you know, starting to frame the legal issues in their cases, and they're starting to really worry and be scared, right? So then you, the librarian comes in and says, okay, you're working on this type of issue. Here's, a, here's an approach to break it down and talks them through that. And here's an approach that would work to research each of those components. Um, so that's a way to, to be involved to be um, to really match the research instruction with what the students are struggling with right in the moment when that's happening. So, 
And I think it could work virtually too. I mean, we've we've done that with clinics that were only online as well. That's great. Thank you. Ron. <laughs> Sorry again. I no. a lot. But um Stephanie, that reminds me that it it sounds very similar to the approach that we at BU and many people, many other schools take with, with legal writing, right? So we co-teach uh, the first year legal research and writing course for the exact same reasons, sort of to sort of um, um, give the librarian sort of street cred in the legal writing arena, but also to, to demonstrate that the process of legal research and writing isn't bifurcated, right? It's like you, it's 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 all a big mishmash. You research while you write, you write while you research kind of thing. And just being there and teaching lessons as part of, you know, part of the course. Um, it sounds, it's effective in legal writing, so it makes complete sense in clinics, if you ask me, but we just don't have the staff. Yeah, I mean, oh. sorry, I was gonna say, I would love to kind of continue this conversation in part because the at least at AU, the clinics overlap a great deal, right? We have two transactional clinics, you know, we like, we have a immigration and a human rights clinics, so you could see where their research world sort of coincide, right? It's a criminal justice clinic and a family law clinic, right? So in a domestic violence clinic, so there's a lot of great opportunity for a sort of intersection and synergy and to train law students that law does not exist in a silo, right? Right, yeah. Um, I think for us, we decided to really sort of use our resources in the clinic because we noticed that that's where the students were really, you know, graduation was was just right on the horizon and they were starting to really panic about whether they actually had the skills they needed to practice law. Um, but it's also really fun for the librarians because, you know, you're dealing with issues as they come up, the students have a lot of energy um, and it's just great to be actually in the room in the teaching environment like that, so. Right. And it teaches you know. them the, the, the real um, skill of knowing exactly when you have to ask for help, right? Getting used to that, you know, um, because that's real. Um, yeah. and now that you mention it, I just today had a com conversation with my head of reference um, about the fact that no one comes to the reference desk anymore. And so they want to just stop sitting there all day. Well, now they can be on call in the clinic. Yeah. That's the new reference desk. It makes yeah. sense. I'll, yeah. I'm going to blame you for that. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, I think we probably uh, have maybe time for one more question, or perhaps Priya and Nick, if you had some last words for us um, before we also sh uh, have our usual teaser at the end that Allison will give. Um, I, I just want to say, if anyone would like to see the resources that I've created, I've got a very helpful. Um, hypo that I use, an outline for my class. Um, I We have a, a sample research log. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out. You know, this is something that I feel very passionately about and I think is really important. Um, Nicholas, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat, if anyone wants to reach out also um, to sort of talk to Nicholas about, he's taught a really great class before on social justice um, so social justice legal research, you know, I'm sure that he could sort of bring a lot more ideas to the table as well. And I'll turn it over to Allison for the spiel. Yeah. Thank you both so much, Priya and Nicholas, for sharing your wisdom and your time with us today. And uh, like so many of our teaching justice sessions, we use this opportunities to ignite the conversation. And it does seem to be a critical mass of institutions and their clinical programs that are thankfully <laughs> acknowledging our brethren in the law library and just how critical um, the they are and the library is to what we do. And so, um, you know, I think we can take this opportunity to really continue that conversation. Priya said, but also to kind of begin to build those practices, to build the scaffolding and to ensure that justice is kept at the heart of it. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and um, look forward to seeing you all on December 8th for our last uh, session of the semester featuring um, participatory scholarship. So uh, have a great week, everybody. Take good care. <laughs>